Guys, find note number three. Note number three, talking about sharing grace. And what I'm de- dealing with right now is heart things, because what you believe in your heart about anything is what's going to begin to come out of your mouth. Or if, if you don't like what you have in your heart concerning something, then put something different in your mouth. That's it. The dynamo works. That's how it works. So, note number three, see yourself, everybody there, as a person with the resources. Like, like when Scripture talks about, you know, people that have resources, you could just read that and go, oh, that's me. Now, re- the reality of that may not be, but the legality is you. And the way you pull that into your life is you have to believe, right? See yourself as that person. Matter of fact, I'm going to go to 1 Timothy 6.17. I'm going to read this out of the Passion. You, if you have your translation, you can go there. 1 Timothy 6.17. Paul's writing first letter to his son in the faith. And a little history as you're turning. Here Timothy is. He's the young pastor at the church at Ephesus. It's the first probably mega church in history. Huge church. And he's got problems. And Paul's covering these problems. And he's gets to the sixth chapter. He's telling him what to do, what not to do. Sixth chapter, verse 17. Again, this is Passion Translation. It says, to all the rich of this world. Now, when you hear statements like that, see yourself as that person. To all the rich in this world. Okay, he's talking to me. What do I do? I command you not to be wrapped in thoughts of pride. Okay, I won't be. Over your prosperity. Okay, I won't be. Or rely on your wealth. For your riches are unreliable and nothing compared to the living God. Trust instead in the one who lavishes upon us all good things. Fulfilling our every need. Remind the wealthy. Oh, that's me. Remind the wealthy to be rich in remarkable works of extravagant generosity. This is where that sharing grace keeps you from being selfish. This is what he's teaching. Remind them to be rich in remarkable works of extravagant generosity, willing to share with others. These spiritual investments will provide a beautiful foundation for their lives and secure for them a great future as they lay their hands upon the meaning of true life. Man, when, you, when you're doing things the way God says to do it, you're really living. This is the way it really is. You know, how many have ever heard of a, a man, his last name is Laterno? Now, how, how many have ever gone by a, like a construction site where they're building a road and they got machines that are so big, the tires are taller than you? Laterno built all that stuff, right? R.G., R.J., Laterno. And uh, the story of his life is so amazing. Christian guy, but he uh, really wasn't really educated just love God and had a desire. He wanted to be the guy to make a difference, right? So he started getting these ideas. And he started, you know, because think about it. If you go to India right now, if you go like Mike and Kevin, they're putting up a building in India. They have, one thing about India, their, their strength is manpower. They got a lot of people, a lot of shovels going, a lot of guys carrying stuff on their head, right? Well, do you understand in our country, we don't have people in those same situations using shovel carrying stuff on your head. We have equipment, right? So some of these equipment that can move yards and yards and yards and yards of dirt instantly. Bam. It can level things instantly. All these kind of things. Laterno built all that stuff. Here was his attitude as he began to uh, increase in wealth, right? So God had removed lack from his life. But here's what happens. When lack is removed from your life, Now your biggest battle will no longer be lack. It will be what? Selfishness. Lack's gone. So here's what he did. He said, God, is it possible? I know that you said the 10% belongs to you, but is it possible? Can I just keep 10 and give you 90? That's what Letourneau said. And before he died, he did it. (laughs) 90% of everything that came in, he gave it. He planted Bible schools. He planted churches all over the world. Yeah. 
But now, did he, did he secure a great future? Absolutely did. Now, I understand, there's other people in his day that had money like he did. But, you know, they probably bought stuff. I don't know about you, but I, I don't have a lot of stuff. I, I, I like the stuff I have, and I'm not connected to it. I give a lot of stuff away. But I don't know how you think, but here's what I think. The more stuff you get, the more you got to steward your stuff. It's like when I was in Tulsa. I love to, to water ski. Right? I love it. But I told the Lord one day, because I understood how this works, and I said, Lord, I don't want a boat. I just want a friend who has one. <laughs> Who wants to take me water skiing? He could love his boat, and he could he could love me going water skiing with him. But I just don't want to dock the boat. I don't want to winterize the boat. I don't want to do all that stuff with the boat. I just want to love God, and preach, and help people. But yeah, I do want to ski, right? So I just learned that you know, wow, finding out who you are and what you want to do, and because sometimes people believe for stuff that to me. It's like they get it and then they can't maintain it or they can't, you know, it's, it's almost like a waste. So Letourneau, he saw that and he thought, you know what? I'm not going to accumulate a lot of stuff. And he had to understand he lived in a beautiful home. That God, God has nothing wrong with that. Drove a beautiful car, all that stuff. God took care of his family greatly, right? He's a multimillionaire even in his day. But he got to the place he just decided, Lord, here's how I'm going to battle selfishness. I'm going to keep 10%. I'm going to give you 90. You know, the other person that did that was J.C. Penney. J.C. Penney did that. He lived on 10% and he gave away 90. Now, you understand that J.C. Penney, when he started, he exploded all over the world. How many know people took over J.C. Penney's that didn't think like J.C. Penney? How are they doing right now? Not so good. They're dying. Right? Well, he kept God in the middle of everything he does. But this sharing grace that I'm talking about, this is, this is real, but you got to see yourself as the one that has the resource. When, when you start saying, now, say to the rich in this world, after you, you don't go, oh, he's talking to somebody else. Who's talking to you? Oh, that's me. What do I need to do? Okay, yeah, I need to do that, that, that. I'm going to read some verses here to you. You could, you could write these down, it, it, just the addresses down. I'm going to go through them kind of quick. Job 27. Job 27, verse 13 through 17. This is Job talking. You know, you guys ever notice that, that God wasn't really happy with Job's friends? I never quote Job's friends, ever. If you ever hear me quoting out of Job, I'm not quoting his friends. If God said you're wrong, I'm, I'm quoting nothing you say. But I quote Job. Job 27, 13. It says, this is what the wicked man, this is what the wicked will receive from God. This is their inheritance from the Almighty. They may have many children, but their children will die in war or starve to death. Those who survive will die of a plague, and not even their widows will mourn for them. Evil people may have piles of money and may store away mounds of clothing, but the righteous will wear that clothing and the innocent will divide that money. Do you think God could do that? See, we live in a day right now there's more money in the world right now. There's more people, but there's more money in the world right now. How, I, how many billionaires do you think there are in the world right now? Lots. Mil it used to be, oh, that person's a millionaire. That's like, pfft. yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of millionaires in this city. I don't know if there's any billionaires, but there's a lot of millionaires. There's some in this, there's billionaires in this state, right? But, here it says here, evil people, it doesn't work out well. But it says here, all those people and everything that they're doing, God's going to transfer that stuff. But you got to be the one that wants to be the one that has the resources. See what I'm saying? you got to be the one. If it's going to transfer to somebody, it's going to transfer to me. And now here, people, here's where you get caught. Yeah, but how? I don't, I don't know how. I'm open. Kelly and I were praying this afternoon, just saying, Lord... Listen, we, we believe that you could do anything. I look around the world and I see what's happening and I, 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 I want to be involved in being the one with resource. Let me give you another one. This is Proverbs 13.22. This is an amplified classic. Proverbs 13.22. It said, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children 
and the wealth of the sinner finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it's laid up. The wealth of the sinner eventually finds its way. So now think about it. If you're one of those pieces, people that say, I don't believe in all that, is it going to find its way to you? Absolutely not. Don't worry. It will not find a way to your door. It will not. But if you say, Lord, Abraham didn't know how you were going to do it, but you did it. How do you part a Red Sea? How do you feed over 2 million people in the wilderness for 40 years? How does their, it says their shoes didn't wear out and their clothes didn't wear out. What, do your shoes grow with your feet? How does he do these things? He's, God, told, God told Moses, he said, listen, I'm going to send in meat. I'm going to send in quail. And he said, God, he's struggling, Moses. And then the Lord asked him a question. He said, is anything too difficult for the Lord? You know, that's an individual question everybody has to answer. I mean, really, we have to be honest with him. Lord, I, I'm choking a little bit right now on that. I mean, it's, my, my man mind is going, tilt. He doesn't mind those conversations. Because you could stop and say, you know what? Even all that's true, I still believe. You could do this. I want to be the one, Lord, involved with the resources. Let me show you another one. Psalms 25, or I'm sorry, Psalms 35, 27. Psalms 35, 27 says, Let those who favor my righteous cause and have pleasure in my uprightness shout for joy and be glad, saying continually. Here's what we say. He said, Let the Lord be magnified who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Wow. Isn't there a verse that says that God doesn't change? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Psalms 35, 27. He takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Write this one down. Ecclesiastes, E-C-C-L-E-S-I-A-S-T-E-S, E-C-C-L-E-S-I-A-S-T-E-S, Ecclesiastes 2.26. You ever read Ecclesiastes and go, Lord, what in the world is going on here? Here's what I've learned about Ecclesiastes. Okay, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Solomon, right? Now, what was one trait that God did in Solomon's life that kind of made him stick out compared to everybody else that was ever king? He's good looking, yeah, probably, but wisdom. Remember? Remember, he, he said God appears to him twice. And he says, ask of me, I'll give you anything. And it's funny because if you read both accounts of it, one time he says wisdom, and the other time he says an understanding heart. And the Lord says, you know, because you didn't ask for riches, long life, nor the death of your enemies. He says, I am going to give you all these things. Right? And I'm going to give you wisdom because you asked for it. Right? Now, one thing about that he gave him wisdom, but you know something Solomon didn't have? And this is what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. When you're such a smart dude that you understand how things work and you do not have the life of God in you, you are bummed out most of the time. Because, I mean, you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Solomon would have the Spirit of God rest on him, but not in him. He's not born again. Otherwise, he'd be in a situation, the Spirit of God would come on him, give him wisdom, and he'd make a decree. And I'm sure that he'd go, wow, that was actually really good. Right? Right? But he didn't have the Spirit of God on the inside of him like you do. So here he is, and he used things like vanity, vanity, it's all vanity. It's all vain. It's all vain. Why? He doesn't understand. Do you understand? Everybody in this room, I'm sure, and watching understand this. If you were to die right now, here's what would happen. We would look at your body as it would fold up and fall or whatever. But you're absolutely still very conscious. You're going to a place that's very, very real. You know you're going to live forever because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Solomon didn't know any of that stuff. Yeah, he knew nothing. There's no Jesus. There's no, all he knew was the moment and wisdom on the earth. Look what he says here. Ecclesiastes 2.26. It says, For to the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. That's a good deal. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and heaping up, that he may give to one who pleases God. 
Ecclesiastes 2.26. He said, this also is vanity and a striving after the wind and a feeding on it. Otherwise, he's trying to figure all this stuff out, why God would do what God does. No, no, no. To the, he says, to the good man, he gives what? Wisdom, knowledge, and joy. To the sinner, it's their job to gather, to heap up that God can give to you. You've got to believe that, though. You've got to believe that. Otherwise, if resources are going to shift, and I believe it's happening right now, all over the earth. If they're going to shift, they're going to shift into my house, into this house. We know what to do. Amen? Look at your note number four. Note number four says, keep your eyes on God, not on what? On money. This is part, this, again, this sharing grace, it keeps us from lack, but also and selfishness. But you can, even when God starts to bless you, you can't get your eyes on money. You, you realize that when you have a lot of money, it's more difficult sometimes to believe God if you have the resources where you don't even need to pray about it. I, Brother Copeland said that one time, and I never really thought about that. The Lord just began to bless him, and it, it got to the place where you have to stop and say, wait a minute, God. Yes, I can do that, but do, do you want me to believe you for this? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? So it's a whole other world when all of a sudden the lack is over. It's done. Then you're dealing in a whole different world. And I, I believe that's what God's taken all of us. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 7. Turn there, guys. First, every Turn there, 1 Timothy 6, 7. This is, this is a so profound yet so simple. 1 Timothy 6, 7. Paul writing to his son of the faith. First Timothy 6, 7 says, For we brought nothing into the world, and obviously we cannot, what? Take anything out of the world. Otherwise, you came in with nothing, you leave with nothing. Right? So would you agree with me that pretty much everything in this world is stewardship? Everything. From your time, to your strength, to your money, to your family. Everything is stewardship. Everything. Absolutely everything. Because when you leave here, you take, you know, one guy said, y y you ever remember that time when uh, all the cars pulled over because the hearst was coming to the graveyard? And remember the hearst had on a big U-Haul trailer? Remember that? And the guy's like, well, no, I don't remember that. Because it never happens. <laughs> because you can't take anything with you. Right? Now, you've heard stories, guys. Bury me in my golden Cadillac. Well, good for you. What does that mean? You know what I mean? Stewardship. Keep your eyes on God, not on money. Knowing that what? This is all about stewardship. All about stewardship. In our American culture, sometimes you have to watch it because that it's so subtle, that thought that says, if I just had more money, I'd be happy. That's absolutely not true. Not true. Or if I just had all my bills paid off or if I was just caught up. No, no, no. No, you still got to use faith. It doesn't matter. You still got to use faith. Absolutely have to. Right? Now, understand, it's not pleasant to go through those things. And you're using your faith and you kind of feel like sometimes, you know, how many remember Stretch Armstrong? Remember Stretch Armstrong? That toy that you just yeah, stretch it way out there. You feel like that sometimes. But, you know, listen, even in the process, there's value. God's teaching you. He's showing us. Now, Stay there. Look at, guys, look at verse, stay there in chapter 6. Look at verse 9. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Classic. I like the way it reads. It says, For those who crave to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish, useless, godless, and hurtful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction and miserable perishing. Boy, is it miserable. It says, For the love of money is the root of all evils. It's through this craving, that's why I like this translation, this craving that some have been led astray and have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many acute mental pains. But as for you, O man of God, flee from all these things. Aim at, pursue righteousness, right standing with God, true goodness, godliness, 
which is the loving fear of God and being Christ-like. Faith, love, steadfastness, patience, gentleness of heart. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you've been summoned and for which you confessed the good confession of faith before many witnesses. Look, let me tell you, that there's nothing wrong. There's, there's nothing wrong with having a heart that's always reaching for Lord, the more that you want to do. And I think that's part of our, our recreated human spirit that's constantly reaching. But to have that in you where you're never content, that's, that's not God. Not God. I met some pretty incontent people. I, I met a guy this, this last year that a very successful businessman here in town, you know, uh, involved, involved with the trades. And uh, 70 years old, said he woke up one morning about a year ago and the Lord says, you know, he's, he's been a, a Christian, but, you know, he, he said this about himself. He said, I have been a lazy, lazy Christian my whole life. Very successful, right? Been to his house, saw all his stuff. Wonderful. Wonderful, you know. But he said, I was such a lazy, lazy Christian that I woke up one morning. The Lord says, what are you doing for me? Well, not a lot, Lord. He said, well, what are you going to do about that? Then I love what he did. He asked the question, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And the Lord gave him exactly what he wanted him to do. Set it in motion. But, you know, here's what I've learned about him, just talking to him. He's happier in his life right now, serving God, <coughs> doing things. That, because I was one of those pastors. He was trying to get to pastors. He's not a pastor. He's trying to. Get, he's a businessman. He's trying to get to talk to pastors and what the Lord has asked him to do. Well, one of the things I my I keep my heart open for Lord. I don't want to miss anything you're doing. So when I met him, instantly the Lord says, "I want you to get to know this guy." I, I didn't even know who he was. Uh, it was uh, Steve Buss introduced me to him. But instantly I knew, wow, I'm supposed to hook up with this guy, right? Well, just getting to know him, do you understand? There was a certain part of his life he was after money, after success, whatever that is. But now he's happier now than he's ever been. Matter of fact, him and his wife, uh, they just got back from, uh, from uh, Flashpoint in Tulsa. That Flashpoint meeting that was in the Maybe Center, just about 10,000 people there. They went to that. I haven't talked to him. I had a chance to talk to him since they got back. But I was texting him. And he's like, wow. Well, yeah, this is what God's doing. See, because it's all stewardship. Does it matter what, what house you lived in? Does it matter what car you drove? You see what I'm saying? Yes. You learn to be content. You could reach and ask God. And you could be involved with a lot of that. That's part of life being increased and having victories and, and worshiping God. And man, Lord, thank you for doing that for me. But but to be incontent and oh, I just want more. I just want more. I just want more. No, no, no. Because here what happens is when if God doesn't deal with the heart when lack's gone, selfishness takes over. And then you start to accumulate. And then it turns to the bumper sticker I saw here in town that says, he who dies with the most toys wins. Wow. Turn to James chapter 5, verse 1. James chapter 5, verse 1. This is the last verse we're going to go over as far as sharing grace. This is the warning that James gives to the rich. He's not talking necessarily even about those in the church because He's dealing with people in general. Yes, he's dealing with the church, but people in general that have this attitude. It's all over the world right now. All over the world right now. And one of the things, the, the bad things that I don't like that are exported out of the American culture that I see overseas is that if you just have more stuff, you'll be happy. And it's being sold to cultures out there that don't need to hear any of that. Because when we live here and you look at it, it's like, oh, mm, wow. Wow. James 5.1 says this, Come now, you rich people. Weep aloud and lament over the miseries and the woes that are surely come upon you. Your abundant wealth has rotted and is ruined, and your many garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver are completely rusted through. I read this verse one time, and I called. There's a guy down here. Well, he used to be off Willamette. He's not here anymore. I called him and said, he said, so-and-so coin shop. I says, I'm going to ask you, Probably the weirdest question anybody's ever asked me. 
Okay. Does gold rust? No. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Insulted him, you know. It's what he does for a living. Well, the Bible says here, your gold and your silver are completely rusted through. And what the Lord showed me is this. In the, in the realm of the Spirit, if you get selfish, right? It says here, keep reading on. And the rust will be a testimony against you, and it'll devour your flesh as it were fire. Wow. You mean it shows up in the natural and it'll affect your natural body? Absolutely will. Absolutely will. You have heaped, listen now, you've heaped together treasure for when? Wow. Guess where we're living right now? The last days. He said, but look here. Look here. Here are the wages you've withheld by fraud from the laborers who have reaped your fields. Do you understand that in any, any given harvest field right here in Eugene, Springfield, the, the, I really believe that all the money needed to harvest this harvest field of souls is in this city. And God wants to give people an opportunity. Not just in this room, in this city. In this city. There's enough to do it. Right? But people, if they won't get involved, they're what? They're By fraud, they're withholding from the laborers who have reaped your field. They're crying out for vengeance. And the cries of the harvesters have come to the ears of the Lord of harvest. Here on earth, you've abandoned yourself to soft prodigal living and to the pleasures of self-indulgence and self-gratification. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter and you've condemned and have murdered the righteous and the innocent man while he offers no resistance to you. Those are tough verses right there. I was studying this out one time, and I was in 1 Timothy 6 that we just read in James 5. And the Lord says, you need to ask people what kind of rich they are. Because it talks about two different kinds of rich in both of those. The rich over here, here's what I want you to do. The rich over here, they're doing their own thing. Amen? Now we're going to shift into last one, which is what? Right here. Serving grace. Serving grace. Guys, I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew 20, 20. And now I'll let you turn there before I give you. I'm going to do note number five as we head into serving grace. The reason I'm going to go over this account in Matthew, you know, this is also in, in Mark and in Luke, but the one in Matthew, the way the Lord says this. And understand... As we read this account in Matthew, it's the Lord talking, so he has insight on stuff. Matthew 20, 20. And we're going to read about eight verses. Yep. Uh, note number five says, The value of the servant's heart, servant's heart, is only eternally measurable. The value of the servant's heart is only eternally measurable. Because there's things that each of you do, I, that I do, eternally measurable. Measurable. Uh, it's only eternity can measure this, right? Because there's things that you do as the Lord asks you to do things that nobody else knows. Things he's asked you to lay down your life in or things he's asked you to be involved with. That This is, this is where it comes in, especially when you're dealing with the poor, you got to be careful. Because it says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. He's talking about preserving the, the, the dignity of people. You know, well, you know, this homeless person, come up front, we're going to help you. Yeah, no, that's so tacky. Come on. <laughs> You're going to help them, help them. But d d don't do that, right? So, but this servant's heart, guys, look what Jesus says. I'm going to start with verse 20. And this is... This is actually in the Passion. You can read it in yours. It said, the wife of Zebedee approached Jesus with her sons, Jacob and John. Yours may say James and John. She knelt before him. Could you see this? She knelt before him and asked him for a favor. He said to her, what is it that you want? She answered, make the decree that these, my sons, will rule with you in your kingdom. One sitting at your right hand, one at your left. And I love this. Jesus didn't even answer her. He looked at the J Jacob and John. 
Jesus replied, you don't know what you're asking. Then looking in the eyes of Jacob and John, Jesus said, are you prepared to drink of the cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? And are you able to endure the baptism and the death that I'm about to endure? And they answered him what? But you know what? They had no idea what they just answered. <laughs> it's easy to say yes. And they, they both did though. They both did in their lifetime. They answered, yes, we are able. He said, you will indeed drink the cup of my suffering and be immersed into my death, Jesus told them. But, listen now, but to be the ones who sit at the place of highest honor is not mine to decide. My Father is the one who chooses them and prepares them. Then the other ten disciples were listening to all this and a jealous anger arose among them against the two brothers. Now, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, called them to his side, and he said, so he sees what's going on, and the Lord's like, oh, i got to fix this right now. He calls all of them right around him. Here's what he says. He says, kings and those with great authority in this world rule oppressively over their subjects, the tyrants, like tyrants. This is not your calling. You will lead by a completely different model. The greatest one among you will live as the one who's called to serve others. Listen to this statement. Because the greatest honor and authority is reserved for the one with the heart of a servant. It says, for even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served, but to serve and to give his life in exchange for the salvation of many. When you're dealing with serving grace... You're dealing with a high call because God is asking you to do something that he does. He calls it the greatest honor and authority is reserved for the one with the heart of a servant. Wow. Wow. I mean, how many of us have, you know, and I've done it. You know, we've been in ministry now almost, my, almost half my life. Yeah, half my life. And then, you know, you, you feel like you've just given your last bit. And then the Lord asks you to do something else. And then I'd like to tell you that I've never complained, but I have. Oh, please. Please. Well, do you understand there's serving grace? There's serving grace. Lord, I will do whatever you ask me to do. Now, never forget this. The Lord right now is taking really good notes. Some people don't ever think about that. Everything you do matters. Everything. When he asks you to do something, and you're so tired, you, you, you feel like, or you're in that place where every nerve somebody's standing on right now, <laughs> and the last nerve you got, somebody else just stood on. There's reward in that. Just to, sometimes, I'm telling you, sometimes you, just gotta, you get alone with the Lord, and you may just cry. And say, you know what, Lord? Thank you for allowing me to serve your people. Why? The greatest honor and authority is reserved for those with a servant's heart. That's what the Bible says. You know, when you read Revelation, there's 24 thrones around the thrones. Let me tell you something I know for absolutely sure about those people. They're all servants. Every single one of them. That's how they got there. Every one of them. Every one of them. It calls them elders. Actually, they could be men or women. Could be. You know? But there, there, there's some, somehow in time, there's something so unique about those individuals that they ended up, that was their prepared place. But when we hear the stories of how they got to where they are, you're going to find out that what Jesus taught right here, they did in their lifetime. They did it. Look at note number six. It's real simple. It says, finding your prepared place. Finding your prepared place. One of the translations of, of the what I just read in Matthew, Jesus said this. It says, what you're asking is my, not mine to give, but it's for him for whom it's been prepared. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in any other place but my prepared place. Because that's where the anointing is and my gifts are. Now, I could look and really appreciate. I mean, I, I, I watch Jordan, right? And I'm about to see him up here and I see him 
in praise and worship practice. I see him and I hear him in there and they're, they're making funny noises and all kinds of stuff when they're going through their stuff. And I, I just say, Lord, what a gift. Uh, and I so appreciate it. You know why? Because I don't have it. I don't have it. It's amazing to me. Because the gift that you're flowing in, you kind of just fit into and people will look and go, wow. Oh, yeah, but it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a serving grace, right? But when you see somebody with a different gift of serving grace, it's like, wow, it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 12, 28, guys. Like, again, I'm going to read it out of the AMP. 12, 28, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. I'm going to read it out of the Amplify, but this is, this is God talking about how he appointed and placed people in the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, So God has appointed and placed in the church for his own use, first apostles chosen by Christ, second prophets, those who foretell the future, those who speak a new message from God to the people, third teachers, then those who work miracles. So far, that's all pretty impressive. Then those with the gifts of healings. Wow. And then what? Helpers. Wait a minute, God. You actually anoint people to be helpers? He absolutely does. And sometimes we'll measure and we'll go, wow, look at that apostolic gift. Look at that prophetic gift. Look at that evangelistic gift. Well, what about the helps gift? That's just a supernatural. Right? Then he says, the administrators. Thank God for Lisa Carroll. Thank God for those people. Ladies on that team, different ones. Jordan's, he, he's on that team helping with church center, all that stuff. Glory. And speakers in various kinds of unknown tongues. That's actually, guys, I don't have time to teach you on this. But that, you know, that's actually a ministry gift. I'm not talking about your prayer language. And I'm not talking about tongues interpretation in a service. I'm talking about, I've seen where people could go right down the line. Usually it's a husband and a wife where one will give the tongue, the other one interpret. One will give a tongue. The other one will interpret. Pretty amazing to watch. It's a ministry gift, right? But here, my, my, my focus on this is God appointed and placed in the church helpers. And again, we're headed into this. Guys right here, very next class, Dr. Buddy Bell. You know, uh, two of Buddy's daughters were in my youth group when I was at Tulsa. You know, and this book, this book came out of Buddy's heart and he would teach at Church on the Move on how to be a helps minister. And that's how this book came, right? But what a, what a great servant's heart that he has. But again, God appointed, God placed in the church. Do you understand that, that uh, just, because, just because some things are spectacular doesn't mean that they're all spectacular, but they're all supernatural. I'll give you an example. I, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody operating in, in the working of miracles. Wow, you know, well, yeah, you guys have. You've seen Jeff Taylor operate in that. I'll operate in that. Kelly operates in that a lot, right? And people, you know, that really impresses people. If you were, if you were to put a radio ad out, you know, uh, absolutely guaranteed miracles happening, you couldn't get people in this building, right? But yet, being a helps minister is just as supernatural as that. <laughs> it's not as spectacular, but it's just as supernatural. Do you think the reward's any different from God? Yeah, but this guy, he did miracles. Lord, that, that, that lady just changed diapers. It's a ministry. <laughs> to God, he's the one that appoints in places. Look at 1 Peter 4.10. 1 Peter 4.10. I'm going to read this out of the passage. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Two verses. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. I just love the way this reads out of the passage. Because we're talking about serving grace. Every believer has received grace gifts. I like this. To use them to serve one another. As faithful stewards of the many colored tapestry of God's grace. For example... If you have a speaking gift, 
Speak as though God were speaking His words through you. If you have the gift of serving, do it passionately with the strength God gives you, so that in everything God alone will be glorified through Jesus Christ. For to Him belong the power and the glory forever throughout all ages. So, finding that prepared place, knowing that there is one, that God is working in you. Do you guys know that if you'll be faithful in what God puts in your hand now, he'll, He may have something bigger for you than you're currently doing, but if, you don't, if you're not faithful what you're doing, you'll never find out. I remember, where, again, I've told this story before, at Church on the Move, I found out they needed greeters. I'm like, what? So I went to the greeters meeting. They told me, I said, wait a minute. You want me to just love people at the door? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> you know, I'd get up and I'd pray every Sunday morning for an hour before I'd go in. You know why? I'm in the ministry now. What's your ministry? I love people. That's all I do. Me and Kelly, we love them. We had Dane Demery, who was a pastor at Church on the Move, and then he left for a couple of years and he pastored a church. And it was funny, just the connections, small world. He, the church that he started, that another guy took over, is the one that Patrick and Lisa Carroll went to in San Diego. <laughs> Small world. Well, when Dane Demery came back, by this time, Kelly and I were, were actually youth pastors in the same ministry doing things. He came, came up to Kelly and I, put his arms around us one time. He says, you know what? He says, in all the years I, I've been in the ministry, in all the years I've seen greeters, I've still never met anybody better than you guys. And the reason is, is why? I, I hook my heart to it. To me, it's real. It's real. I, am, I, 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 am, I was just as passionate about greeting at Church on the Moon as I am preaching right now. Because I see it as ministry. It's health ministry. But it's ministry. It's not less than. Amen? Guys, go, go to note number seven. It, the principle... The principle, we're going to talk about the principle of gift development. The principle of gift development. Otherwise, what I mean by that is this. When Kelly and I were greeting, I, I don't care if I would have been the greeter there the rest of my life. I never saw, I've never seen any ministry, any part of ministry as a stepping stone to anything else. I never have. Ever. Why? Because I engage my whole heart in what I'm doing. And well, all of a sudden, it's not my job to open doors. It's God's job. So here we are. We're greeting. And then they approached us and said, you know, you're greeting. Would you guys also like to be altar workers? I said, yes. So, man, we start training on that. So we greet in the morning and then we work in altar care. Right? And then all of a sudden, we just had this real unction from God. And they had a youth pastor there, and I just felt like, man, I'm, I'm supposed to help this guy. His name's Blaine Bartell. I go up to him. I said, Blaine, I said, we've been going here a while now, and I really think that Kelly and I are supposed to help you. And he said, tell you what, could you hold off? Nobody in the church knows this right now, but I'm leaving in about 30 days, and a new friend of mine's coming in named Dwayne Erickson. I said, oh, yeah, I'd love that. Love so Dwayne came in, and, man, we are, we're helping Dwayne. Right? What's happening? There, there's a principle of gift development. I didn't know I had a gift in this. I just follow an unction. Right? So here I am with Dwayne, and we're doing all kinds of stuff. Talk about being uncomfortable. Wow. We had no idea. We're just serving grace, serving grace. Lord, what do you want to do? Well, then all of a sudden, may, maybe a year or so go by, and they bring in another guy named Jim Weidman. Right? And Jim Weidman, they ended up splitting the youth group because it was getting so large, junior high and senior high, right? Because that youth group was 250 teenagers, right? So they, they split that. And Jim took over the junior high group, and also he took over the bus ministry. Now, a lot of people don't know this. When he hired me at Church on the Move to, to run the junior high youth group in the bus ministry, I'd never ministered to kids in my life. But yet... There was a gift development on the inside. Jim saw something. And he says, you know what? You could do this. And I went, you think so? <laughs> yes. And it ended up that even the bus ministry, on a Saturday, it was 
listen to me, one of the best ministries ever. You're going into low income, usually single parent, minority, the projects of North Tulsa, right? And we're mining these kids out of darkness. And it goes from 120 kids to 300, and I'm thinking, wow. Then it goes to 400, 500, 600, 750. And we are busting these kids in, right? I saw kids get, I saw things, crazy stuff. One kid, I had a ventriloquist in, he, he did a service and had 17 kids at the altar. And, he, and I'm in the back, I'm just crying. Thank you, Jesus. You know what I mean? He says, yeah, yeah, I see Pastor Brian back there. I want you guys to just go with him. He's going to kind of help you out and show you what just happened to you. Well, one kid steps on another kid's foot while they're turning around, and he just cold cocks him at the altar. Bam! Knocks him out. And I'm like, they don't teach you this in Bible school. What do you do with that? <laughs> These are tough kids. Super tough kids. <clears throat> I mean, this kid just got saved. And the first act he does is knock out the other kid. I mean, they're serving grace. I call him aside. Why did you do that? Well, he stepped on my foot. Dude, he didn't mean to. No, these are broken kids. I'm talking these are tough kids. Right? But the serving grace is there, guys. But there's a principle of gift development. It just takes time sometimes. I'm laying on the floor. The bus ministry is growing. I'm laying on the floor of the office. You know, I don't feel like I'm doing anything well. But I'm right in the middle of serving grace. Right? And I'm laying, I'm crying in my office, door shut, lights out. I said, God, help me. <laughs> and here's what he said to me. Delegate or die. And I'm like, what does that mean? What does that even mean? And he begins to show me. I had seven bus captains at the time. Right? And I was doing all, all preaching. I was doing all that. And he showed me exactly what to do. Wisdom. He said, I want you to take the service. You, you, you slice that service up into seven parts. Every week, one of those bus captains are going to do a different part of that service. Right? I mean, I, I, had, I had an object lesson, an illustrated sermon. We had puppets. We had praise and worship. We had just we sh offering. The whole thing was just split up into seven things. And I had a meeting with them. I still remember their faces. I called them in. I said, guys, here's what we're going to do. Didn't ask them, what do you think? Didn't none of that. Here's what we're going to do. From now on, start next week. I got some things I'm going to give you guys today. But there's gonna, every single week, each one of you are going to have a, just a part of this of the service, right? Different. It's going to rotate. Each of you are going to get familiar with a different part of the service. And I remember one guy raised his hand and he says, Pastor, I don't think I could do this. His name is Kip Lawson. I said, Kip, you're going to do awesome. <laughs> now, do you, do you understand that out of those seven guys, I think four or five became children's pastors in the future of megachurches? all over the country. They were the best of the best. But when I sat down and I split up that service the very next Saturday, I sat in the back and cried. It was so horrible. It was horrible, guys. It was the worst children's ministry I've ever seen in my life. I'm just saying, God, are you sure this is going to work? Next week, they got better. Next week, they got better. Next week, they got... Six months, every one of them was better than me. But what is it? It's a principle of gift development. They got really, really good at this. But what the Lord taught me was, if you always hold something, right, and you never allow others to do anything, you're always going to do it. Remember, I was crying. God, help me. You know what my job turned out to be? I had, the, I, I had, all, all, I had 100 volunteers on my bus ministry, right? My job was to love all my volunteers, make sure everything was covered, Right? Make sure, I mean, I had people stuffing candy. I had people doing prizes. I had all kinds of stuff going on. Sometimes if I, had, if I was short a bus driver, I would drive. Right? But I got to a place, here's my whole job. I just loved on kids. That's all I did. I didn't preach. So I'm standing out and the buses are coming in. I'm like, hey! <laughs> That's my job. And some of these, some of these kids, you know, I'm a lot of... Uh, Asian kids, African American kids, Hispanic kids. There were different projects in Tulsa, in that it, it just turned out this way. Predominantly, there's different races in each project, right? We shipped them all in. 
kept them all in. Man, I'm just loving kids. Now, understand, you, you got to believe God because, so, you, you know, some, well, maybe 10% always have lice. It is what it is. Some of them smell so bad. Why? Because sometimes they're knocking on doors and you can see in, right? And both the mom and dad are just strung out. So you, you know, find out clothes you can, put it on the kid, get him in the bus. Right? But my, I'm telling you, if, if, if I could call in my bus workers wherever they are in the world right now, a lot of them would tell you those are some of the best times in my life. You know why? It's right here, serving grace. Did they, were they tired? Are you kidding me? Some of the things we went through, one, one bus guy, one of my bus captains, lost a kid. What do you do with that? It was just a little guy. He wasn't paying attention. He got off on the wrong site. <laughs> and all of a sudden, his mom's like, where's my son? Uh, ma'am. <laughs> Serving grace right here. But you see, but there, there's a principle of gift development. Listen, everybody's got to start somewhere. But if you instantly shut it off and say, well, you know, I just, I'm really uncomfortable with that. No, no, no. And we'll get more into that as we get into this Ministry of Helps class. But I wanted to end with this tonight, guys. Just Did we go over all the questions? Okay, good. I just wanted to end with, with this serving grace in a way that we're going to transition into the Ministry of Helps. But everyone here, you guys are all good help. All good help. And I'm not teaching you this because you don't get it. But, you know, I want you to teach others so they can get it. Because, man, there's a lot of the body of Christ worldwide. I mean, the culture in this church is amazing in a sense that I, I don't think that we need to hire everybody to do all the things that we can do. Like Sawyer, Sawyer, when we're done with youth, he's like, okay, here we go. All these, do, do you set this stuff up? Do you do this? Right? Here's the motivation. You can't go down and eat until it's set up. That's a big motivator. Right? But what are you doing? You're creating a culture, even on our work day. Wow. What, what, what happened there? Well, people are owning, this is not my church. This is not your church. This is our church. And when, the, the, when that people, people understand, no, no, I need to serve somewhere. I need to use my gift somewhere. That's where true joy is. Amen? And I want to start with this. Anybody have any questions? What's that? Well, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go over some of your study sheets. Study sheets. Uh, look at session, session uh, one. First question, by grace you've been saved through faith. That's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, as anyone should boast. Did you have all those filled in? Look at questions. Excuse me. I'm yawning. Look at a question number four on that session one sheet. The graces involve with both processes, the new birth, inward change. What does it say? What's the word after that? Regeneration. Transformation, outward change is what? Renewing. Yes. Let's look at a... Session two, note number one, no matter how good you believe God is, he's always better than you think he is. Note number two, be like the benevolent judge. What are those four things there? And forgiving. Note number three, but... Found what? In the eyes of the Lord. That's, guys, that's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. If you ever read uh, verses 6 and 7 before that, 
if there was no verse 8, it would have been over. Because he just said, I'm done with man. I, 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 it actually says, I, I'm grieved in my heart that I've made man. Isn't that sad for God to have to get to that place? Thank God for Noah. Note number four. Grace not only has a salvation expression, it leads us to live a productive, satisfying life for him. Uh, note number five is, what's, what's that first? Saving grace, God's power and ability to justify us, forgive our sins, and make us a new creation in Jesus. Note number six, sanctifying grace, God's power and ability to purify us, enable us to live holy lives in a corrupt world. Number seven is strengthening grace, God's power and ability to energize, inspire us to live victoriously. To reign over challenges and circumstances of life. Note number eight. Sharing grace. God's power and ability to meet our needs and take joy in giving to others. Number nine. Serving grace. God's power and ability to serve him and others with his divinely imparted gifts and aptitudes. Simplest definition of grace is what? Love acting. Look at uh, session number three. Jesus had more heaping portions of grace to give. Note number two. First, grace is seen operating continuously throughout Scripture. <clears throat> Otherwise, from beginning to end, you'll see grace operating in there. Note number three. Every aspect of who we are is to be an by his grace. Note number four. There is nothing passive about God's grace. Just like there's nothing about his love toward us. Note number five. If you partake of and grow in his grace, you will be conformed more and more to the and likeness of Jesus. Note number six. Legality, what is that? Positional truth versus reality. That's behavioral application. Uh, note number seven. John Newton addresses both kinds of fear and amazing grace when he wrote, "'Twas grace that taught and grace." My fear is relieved. Note number eight. Smith Wigglesworth quote, "'If you wait to... Until you are, you're too late. Too late. Don't wait to prepare. Note number nine. Sharing grace gives freely, generously, and, and God measures the gift by the, not simple, simply by amount. Okay. Number four. Note number one. Sharing grace starts in your, with your, with your measure. Now, note number five, five things you have to settle in your, what's number one? What kind of God is God? Number two, did he really mean what he said? Number three, number four, can he be trusted? Number five. Amen. Note number three. See yourself as a with the. Amen. And guys, I can't stress that one enough because I don't know what kind of home you were raised in. But I was not raised in the home where you saw yourself as the one with the resources. That was always like somebody else. But, but again, we're, we're not talking about greed. We're not talking about we're talking about prosperity with a purpose. And so when it gets into that mode, it's like, okay, Lord, I'm going to be, see myself as a person with resources. Note number four, keep your eyes on, not on money. Note number five, the value of the servant's heart is only eternally measurable. Only God can measure that. Number six, 
Finding your, your prepared place. And then seven, the, of what? Gift development. Otherwise, doesn't matter where you start, that's not where you're going to end up if you just hang in there with God. Any questions, guys? I want to have Jordan come. He's going to talk a little bit about when the tests do and readings do and all that good stuff. All right. Did you guys learn anything about grace? Anybody? I did. Any, any, yeah, me too. I definitely learned some stuff. So, uh, yeah, the exam is already up, already live, ready to go. Um, so that is due by 11.59 p.m. this coming Saturday. Um, and, you know, something that we get to learn as students is, you know, if you know that you're going to be busy Saturday or busy Friday or busy th Thursday or whatever, just plan your life so that you can get your exam done so that you don't... And that's something we get to learn as students because, you know, sometimes you have to plan your life to get things done in ministry as well. Um, th it's not always possible to ask for an extension. And so, yes, we like to give grace when, where we can. But sometimes, you know, if, if the worship set is Sunday morning, I can't go to Pastor Brian and say, hey, I didn't get the songs done. Can I have an extension? No. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So we've got to make sure that we plan our lives to get things done. Um, so that is my exhortation to you for this. Um, and then make sure your reading is done at the time that you turn in your exam, of course. Make sure that you have all of your worksheets in. And we're going to ask that you start labeling your worksheets so that we know what's going on. And it saves Salome and me and Pastor Deborah lots of time if you label, label them. You know, this is worksheet for this class or whatever. Just change the file name because don't turn it in with a whole bunch of numbers because when you turn them in for class after class with the same numbers, then it starts to overwrite them and then we get confused. So <laughs> please just help us out, label your worksheets turn, and make sure that they all get turned in. Um, the email address is academic.assistant at harvesteugene.org for that. Yes, Kiera. Mm -hmm. I mean, ch change the actual file name of the files that you're sending to Salome. So like, cause it'll be like, 1z delta alpha gamma dot jpg and then we when you get more than one of with that file name then it starts to overwrite them it's really weird um it's dumb <laughs> Com computers sometimes are dumb it's true um okay so i think that that is everything the Oh, and the exam is another one of those with six questions. You only have to answer five of them, but you do, everyone must answer question number six. If you don't choose not, if you choose not to answer a question, make sure you put uh, no answer or something like that. Otherwise, it won't let you submit your exam and then more confusion happens. So <laughs> if you don't answer a question, if it's one of those exams where you get to choose five and the, but there are six you have to put something in there even if it's a couple of spaces so otherwise it's like blank field cannot submit and it's crazy so yeah uh there we go what no this is that's what i would say. there are six questions or five of them yes, question number six okay <laughs> <laughs> never, never land. All right. Have a good night.